with medical goods to ensure supermarkets are stocked with fresh food and to maintain deliveries of essential energy and food supplies, from hauliers and train drivers to those keeping our ports and airports open. Each and every one of us depends on the transport lifeline that they provide. And they, of course, are part of an army of critical workers helping to fight this terrible scourge. But for, before we can consider if it's safe to amend these restrictions, we must first satisfy we have met the first the five tests set out by the First Secretary to ensure that the NHS can continue to cope, that the daily death rates fall sustainably and consistently, that the rate of infection is falling, that operational challenges have been met, and most importantly, that there is no risk of a second peak. Now, we don't know yet when that day will come, but I do know that that day will arrive sooner if motorists and others continue to only make essential journeys. The actions I've announced today will ensure that the transport can continue to serve the nation during this crisis, keep us supplied with everything we need to stay at home, yet also ensure that infrastructure required to emerge from this pandemic stands ready to serve us all when that time does arrive. I'd like to turn to Dr Jenny Harris. Thank you. Um, so just to evidence how hard I think we've all been working uh, and the results of that work in, in relation to the five key criteria that we're trying to achieve, uh, we have some familiar slides here. Um, and to note, obviously, on the first one, this is uh, uh, highlighting the change in our transport use. Uh, it was right down to 59% uh, uh, lower than the first week of February. Uh, it has risen a little bit, just 2 or 3% in the last week. Um, and I would like to just reinforce how uh, important it is that we retain uh, that success in reducing uh, the amount of contacts that we're having and our travelling, uh, which uh, we know has contributed significantly to supporting uh, the change in transmission of disease. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next slide shows the uh, numbers of cases reported. These are when lab tests are completed. That's sometimes a few days uh, after the test itself. Um, and there are two colours on here. And what you'll notice as we go through the slides is, firstly, obviously, that the total number of cases has risen. Uh, it represents an epidemic curve of a type, uh, but there is a fluctuation relating to the reporting of the tests. But uh, importantly, the curve is flattening, uh, which I think indicates the reduction in cases and transmissions, but uh, just with a little caveat as we go forward, uh, with the increased numbers of tests available, and that's particularly in pillar two, that's the orange colour on the slide, uh, we will expect to see in some ways an increase in cases because we're having an increase uh, in detection numbers. So this is a good signal. We are um, flattening that curve. It rose sharply and it's levelled off, but don't be surprised if cases do increase a bit as our actual testing increases as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so this slide uh, demonstrates the um, people in hospital uh, with confirmed COVID-19. Uh, uh, and this has fallen, obviously, very markedly in London. Uh, we can see how hard the NHS was working, uh, particularly in the first uh, week in April, um, and the success that that's had. Um, and in fact, I think on the number of inpatients who've been uh, diagnosed with COVID in the last 24 hours, uh, for the first time in many, many weeks, this has fallen below 1,000. So this is real success uh, and many other success stories, as you can see, with many areas working really hard. Uh, but we do need to keep our social distancing measures going. We must not allow those peaks to start curving upwards again. Next slide, please. Um, and again, uh, critical care uh, bed use, uh, we can see uh, a sharp rise. Um, I know there were concerns in members of the public about whether our capacity would be sufficient. Uh, it has always been sufficient. Um, and increasingly, on a day-to-day -day basis, as we manage uh, the disease and the uh, epidemic in the UK, the numbers of beds available uh, has significantly risen. Uh, so there is no, a lot of hard work, of course, on the front line, and we mustn't underestimate that by NHS colleagues, uh, but capacity is continuing to increase 
uh, as we move forward. Next slide, please. Um, and then, uh, sadly, of course, we report the deaths which happen. Um, these are deaths which are confirmed in hospital. Uh, they're not reported until all the uh, paperwork is cleared. So again, you will see some variation uh, in the reporting. But generally, uh, an increase in deaths as the uh, epidemic uh, spread. Uh, and then very gradually, but subtly, uh, an overall decline, a trend in downward uh, death data. Next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, this tries to give an indication, it's very difficult because of the difficult comparisons uh, of death data between countries, but to indicate uh, how the UK is doing uh, in relation to uh, other uh, parts of the world. Uh, the far right uh, blue death uh, line, which you can see marked as UK hospitals only, uh, indicates the, the data that we've just seen on the preceding slide. Uh, and then increasingly we are trying to uh, provide a much broader indication to ensure that we're capturing uh, deaths which are not just in hospital but that we know will be happening uh, in communities to make sure that we're clear uh, how, uh, how we are managing the disease and to make sure uh, that we are looking after those who are most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. I'd like to turn now to Hugh Pym, the BBC. Hugh. Thank you. Uh, online booking for virus testing has clearly proved very popular. Thousands of workers got the slots they wanted or managed to book kits. Others may well have been disappointed. What assurances can you give about future demand being met and how much will capacity go up over the next few days? Hugh, thanks very much. Um, I can tell you actually that uh, there were reports that the website had crashed, which it hadn't. It was simply that the slots for today uh, were uh, taken up. We've seen, haven't we, in the last few days, this difference between the capacity available, I think the last figure I saw was 51,000, and the number of tests uh, done, uh, 28,000 uh, yesterday, uh, and uh, how important it is to make sure we're using that available uh, capacity, uh, people being able to book online directly, that's all the critical uh, workers, 10.72 uh, million people uh, with their families, uh, are those who are available now to use that um, site. I can tell you also that 16,000 uh, of those were booked uh, during the uh, first period of that being uh, online. Uh, and the site has actually been brought back up uh, around now uh, for more people to go and book sites. It will then uh, close off again, more sites will become, more uh, tests will become available um, tomorrow and so on. Um, so the answer is, as we heard from Professor Newton standing uh, here yesterday, uh, it looks like the trajectory to 100,000 um, tests uh, by the end of April is going to be uh, met in terms of capacity. Uh, I would say after uh, the experience today, it looks like the demand is there, and if those two things come together, of course, then we'll have that 100,000 uh, tests uh, per day uh, ambition met. Um, so that's the status of the situation. One more thing to add is that we have heard from the devolved administrations uh, who also now want to join uh, in using um, that uh, online booking system uh, as well. Did you want to come back to you? Uh, no, just to say, uh, obviously, you don't want people's expectations to be disappointed. Uh, just to sum up, are you, are you pretty confident that you can meet the, the demand that is out there, certainly in the next week or so? I think it's fair to say that um, so no one, of course, quite knows. We, we know what the capacity is. We don't quite know how many people would want to be uh, tested because uh, you know, many people working for the NHS, for example, will have already uh, accessed those tests through their workplaces. This is now a much wider uh, number of people, key workers, critical workers, including, for example, the transport workers that I was talking about in my comments, and we don't know the answer to how many of that will be. I do know, and it is worth stressing to people when they go to that site, that, that this is a test which will only test if you currently have coronavirus. So there's no point to go on there and test to see if you had it three weeks ago. It's not going to give you the answer uh, to that question. So it's a current day um, thing. We'll see how it um, settles down. Uh, but we're encouraged by um, those 16,000 bookings online. Indeed, 46,000 people uh, went to the uh, portal um, first thing uh, today. Uh, there's some more slots opening up right now as I'm speaking. Uh, and there'll be more slots tomorrow, days after. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add, Jenny, well, that may well cover it all. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh. Uh, I'll turn to Roger Johnson, um, BBC North West. Roger. 
Secretary of State, thank you very much. I'll, I'll ask one in a moment, if I may, about light rail systems, which you talked about. But talking about social distancing, the sun has been shining in the North West, as in a lot of places for, for a couple of weeks now, which in this part of the world is an achievement. Um, I had a, a conversation today with a lady called Jo, whose sister was a healthcare worker who works in a hospital in South Manchester. She died of COVID-19. It was her funeral today. Um, she was in tears on the phone when I spoke to her when she talked about the number of people who were out on the streets as they drove back from the funeral, not practising social distancing. And I wonder, as the police forces here say that it is becoming an increasing problem, whether it is possible to manage people's expectations about how much longer the lockdown will go on, and perhaps, if necessary, to encourage the police rather than to police by consent, to go back to a, a different way of policing as they did at the beginning. I wonder what your thoughts were. Look, I think overall, I mean, it's, you know, it's tragic to hear stories like that. And I think overall, the country's done incredibly well uh, in adhering to social distancing. And there is a danger as we go into yet another warm, sunny uh, weekend that people think that perhaps these graphs are showing that uh, you know, the, uh, the peak is over. But as Jenny was very clearly showing, and I'll ask her to comment in a moment, it isn't over. We're riding uh, perhaps, a, a, I, we hope, a downward trend, but it's by no means, by no means established yet. And when people ask me, you know, when will the uh, measures, the social distancing, the stay-at-home measures um, be altered? My, my answer in some ways is some of this lies in your own hands. The more we adhere to it uh, and are strict about the social distancing uh, that's required, the faster uh, that decision will be able to be made. But that decision, of course, will be made entirely on the advice of science uh, and uh, medical uh, advice. Jenny, can I turn to you? Yes. Um, so I think, I mean, the story you provide is uh, often a very powerful one. Uh, people who have lost relatives or loved ones or colleagues at work um, really feel when uh, they see people flouting the social distancing requirements. And it is absolutely critical that we maintain them. It does, of course, demonstrate why, uh, although this is a very science-led approach, that science includes behavioural science. Uh, and right at the start of uh, the advice that was given, there was a considerable amount of uh, debate and discussion and evidence uh, looked at relating to how people comply with social distancing. Um, and these are very difficult things to get the balance right. Um, on the whole, uh, as we've just seen, the whole, uh, most of the public are really complying and really supporting. That becomes increasingly difficult as we go through. Uh, but actually just pretending that we can jump out of it easily is not the answer at all. We will lose all the benefit of the hard work that we've done if we lift that. So I think absolutely we need to encourage everybody to comply um, and perhaps just keep explaining. I, we perhaps sound a little monotonous sometimes, uh, but really important. So even the basic things that we started with, washing hands frequently um, when you've been out, when you come in, before you have your food, and keeping two metres away from other people are absolutely critical. And Roger, you mentioned you wanted to come in on, on light rail as well, I think. Yes, thank you very much. It's just a quick question for you, really. 95% uh, down passenger numbers on the Manchester Metro. Um, Andy Burnham, the Greater Manchester Mayor, said it was within days of having to be mothballed, but clearly it's crucial for key workers to get to work. So therefore, government support to keep it running is welcome. I just wondered how soon that money will come through and what form it will take. So I've been in contact with uh, Andy Burnham and other mayors in the last few days and indeed throughout the, throughout the whole of this crisis. Uh, and um, we absolutely agree that support is uh, required uh, and in this package um, today, uh, which is uh, which should be substantial, um, assistance will be provided. I think it's fair to say, though, uh, we're not looking to try to run services. As you say, 95% of people aren't travelling. We're not looking to run the full service whilst this is uh, ongoing. But it is very important that they're available, not least to get those critical workers to the NHS and, uh, and, and around, uh, as discussed. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're pretty much there, and no doubt I'll be speaking to the mayors and others um, this coming weekend about it as well. Thank you very much indeed. Can I turn to uh, Heather Edwards, ITV Meridian. Good afternoon. Um, to the Secretary of State, please. Um, you've just announced there's ten and a half million pounds of government money to keep these essential ferry services running between the mainland and the Isle of Wight and the Isles of Scilly. But we do know of other ferry companies that are struggling because of this lockdown. 
Notably, the Port of Dover um, P&O ferries it says it urgently needs £150 million pounds of government money if it's going to stay afloat. Of course, they're currently bringing in food and medicines to the UK. Will they also get the government funding? Uh, and secondly, if I could just say, um, we believe about 15,000 people a day are still flying into UK airports from overseas. None are being checked for COVID. Uh, we now have the Chief Executive of Heathrow Airport personally appealing to you and the Health Secretary to screen passengers as they come in. Why? Because it's currently not being done. Uh, thanks very much, Heather. I, I referred in my speech to a trilateral agreement uh, that we've reached with uh, the French and the uh, Republic of Ireland uh, government, which is about that critical freight flow to which you refer, P&O, Stenner and others. Uh, and in my remarks, I also uh, made reference to 26 different freight routes uh, from Britain, France, Belgium, many other countries, I won't repeat the list, which have been secured as well. Uh, that is in addition uh, to those uh, freight services uh, and uh, transport services which have been secured uh, to places like the Isle of Wight uh, and also the links from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. So all of those things are included in, in the package and will ensure that a minimum level of service is provided uh, that some people can go to the shops and be confident uh, that the goods are back on the shelves uh, and remain there as they are now um, throughout the rest of uh, this crisis. Um, look, with regards to flights, uh, it is the case that, um, of course, people uh, have been able to fly here. The numbers are down massively. Um, there's probably only 4 or 5% of the flights that were taking place before this crisis, and the load factors are very low. Uh, quite a lot of the people returning, 1.3 million of them, I think, so far, have been British nationals abroad who wouldn't have been able to come back had it not been uh, for those flights. The uh, requirements for anyone coming to this country um, at the moment are to stay in one place and not leave uh, for uh, any reasons. And as we come out of, or any of the reasons outside of the fourth stated, as we come out of this and into the next phase at a future point, uh, we will continue to keep the excellent medical scientific advice we receive under review to say whether uh, those procedures at airports should change. But I do just want to make this point. Countries that lock down the flights, uh, I'm thinking, for example, in the United States, who prevented uh, Brits from flying there or Europeans from flying there in other countries, uh, have not necessarily weathered the storm of the coronavirus any better, and many of them um, have seen uh, much higher levels of deaths. So uh, although it should and must be part of the plan going forward, I think it's probably more useful during the um, phase of test, track and trace that the uh, Health Secretary was talking about yesterday. Jenny, I think that's probably Yes, very, yeah, very happy to. I mean, th this country and many others learnt a lot, actually, from the West African Ebola outbreak, and uh, there's been considerable discussion since then. Um, and there are periods when uh, elements of screening, and I use that word advisedly because it means very different things to different people, uh, can be very reassuring to the public and can be helpful. So, for example, if you have a country which has a very high uh, rate of, a, um, of an illness like Ebola, um, an exit screening programme to prevent people leaving the area and dispersing across the world can be helpful. Um, and certainly early in this uh, particular pandemic, of course, you'll be aware that we uh, very closely uh, quarantined people, for example, coming back from uh, Wuhan and the very high risk areas. Once the prevalence of disease uh, balances, if you like, across the world, that becomes a less effective mechanism. Um, and, and as the Minister said, what, would, uh, what may well become uh, an opportunity is when our rates are very tightly controlled uh, and uh, individuals are coming into the country. Even then, it's not quite as simple, so I think often an average traveller will be very reassured with a sort of thermometer scanning gun uh, but if I said to you, if you look at the detail of those, that the variation in reliability of their temperature uh, control and, and recording can be two or three degrees, plus or minus, uh, and it may depend on the ambient temperature or even the colour around that scanning unit, you can see that it's quite problematic in saying whether an individual should be pulled in or out for screening. Equally, people can uh, often 
we're relying on them often to provide uh, their own story. And I think the most critical point is when somebody comes through a port of entry, uh, they may be there going through two or three minutes. Uh, an incubation period for this disease, I think, runs into about 21,500 uh, minutes. So the likelihood of sort of grabbing somebody at that point is quite small. But there are important considerations for doing that, um, and I know that the uh, government is looking at those. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, can I turn to Dan Hewitt uh, of ITV? Hello, uh, good afternoon to both of you. Um, given that you promised um, 10 million key workers and their families who are showing symptoms uh, a coronavirus test, do you accept that you raised expectations way beyond anything you can deliver, considering you only have 5,000 home testing kits and 15,000 drive through appointments? Do you regret raising expectations as high as you have? And given that right now on the government website there's no eligibility tests to prove that you're a key worker, you're effectively trusting anyone who goes on that website uh, to book uh, an appointment for a test or book a home kit without any checks on who they actually are, would you at some point consider changing that, bringing in checks if the numbers continue to be so high? Um, thank you. Look, we'll always keep this under review, particularly the operation of um, that, uh, that, that website. Um, but I think it is true to say that it, it's, although, although there are as you say, 10 million or 10.72 million is the actual figure, um, key workers and families, or households, I should say more accurately, um, who uh, are eligible. Um, as I stressed before, th there's actually no point taking a test, I think, from a medical point of view, I'd defer to Jenny on this, unless you think you have some symptoms, unless you have a reason to be taking it, and particularly no point in, in, in taking a test if you uh, already um, had it three weeks ago, or you suspected you, you did, you, you, you probably missed the boat, I think. Um, but look, in terms of expectation management and, and the rest of it, um, the Health Secretary stood here, made a very clear pledge at the beginning of the month. A lot of people thought it would be difficult to achieve to get to 100,000. We can see capacity has been rising uh, very fast. Then people quite rightly said, well, what about the demand for these tests? You're not just getting through enough of them. Um, the fact that people now want those tests, now we've made it much easier to obtain them, I, I think is a good thing. I think it's, uh, it's helpful and we will have to see in the coming days how we balance uh, that um, demand with the, available, with the availability of, of um, tests. Uh, but uh, I think I'm right in saying that everyone would welcome us getting to the 100,000 um, figure and it would be very uh, good to see that demand match with the capacity which has increasingly been available. Yes, I, I just wanted to reinforce the, the point that you made about the, this is the have you got it now test um, and it will be a wasted test if people uh, track online, uh, take one of those tests up uh, and that to find it's a negative. What we really want to do uh, is encourage uh, those who have symptoms to take the test or where somebody in their family does um, and if those do prove negative with a certain number of caveats which are, are outlined uh, then it does mean that those people can be back at work and their families can be out circulating within the social distancing rules as normal so it is important that the public um, use these tests in the way that they were intended because that will benefit all of us but particularly our frontline services. Dan you look like you might want to come back. Well, I don't, only to say that we're talking here about key workers, many of whom do shift work. So if you're opening the website at 8 o'clock in the morning, many of them can't sit at home with their computer hitting refresh or they're trying to buy tickets for a festival. It's not that simple. So is there a system you can come up with that means that there isn't this rush every single morning for these people who aren't necessarily going to be at home able to do that? Yeah. Well, look, actually, I think uh, one of the things I should mention is yesterday one of the slides showed there were 27 drive through sites. I can tell you... Today, there are now 31 uh, regional drive-through sites, so we're making it easier by having more of these to, for people to be able to uh, get to them uh, quicker. Uh, I think by the end of uh, next week, I think it is, we're aiming to increase that number uh, uh, quite a lot uh, again. So the, the, I think it's 48. I, I think the, the point is we want to make it as easy as possible. We do have uh, a smaller number at the moment, but it's in trial, as it, as it were, of um, home tests picked up by uh, courier afterwards to be uh, tested um, and hopefully we'll be able to expand that program uh, as well but I think that if by the end of next week the end of the month um, we've got somewhere near that uh, that, that, that goal uh, of, um, of 100,000 I think in comparative terms internationally that's actually a very 
high number and Jane may have more. I, I just wanted to, to point out a sort of very obvious clinical feature, which is I, I recognise uh, there's a challenge about the process, but of course, if you are symptomatic and you're a critical worker, you should not be at work. You should be at home. Um, you may not feel quite well enough to be hitting a button on a computer, but please do not be at work if you're symptomatic and needing a test. That's a very good point. Of course, you shouldn't be there in, in the first place. That's, that's true. Um, but, but look, I think, you know, it, it, I don't, we have to sort of be sensible about this. Everybody recognises this is building a test system from scratch. Everyone knows it's an enormous uh, challenge. Uh, and I think the, uh, the NHS um, and many of the outside organisations who've been involved in this um, have really been rising uh, to the challenge. And it looks like uh, meeting uh, those numbers will be possible and hopefully balancing both the demand and the capacity uh, for those tests as well in the coming days. Thank you very much, Dan. Can I turn to uh, Annabel Dixon, Politico? Thank you, Secretary of State. Uh, first question for you. Um, the latest round of Brexit talks finished today with both sides admitting that limited progress was made. Senior figures in a key sector for your department, the haulage sector, have warned that the coronavirus outbreak means they're simply not in a position to give the complexity of future trade arrangements with the EU the necessary focus, and they believe the transition period should be extended. Uh, are they wrong? Um, and a question for Dr. Harries as well. Um, we saw today the huge demand for home testing kits from key workers who are now able to apply. Anyone who's watched a um, coronavirus testing administered can see it's not a simple task. Are you confident that these tests will be reliable? And do you know what the failure rate is for these self-administered tests? Uh, Annabelle, thank you very much. I'll take the, the first point about the Brexit talks. And um, uh, people may not be aware that these have been uh, continuing um, during this period. And they take place via uh, video. Uh, and as you rightly say, the latest round has just taken place. But actually uh, included some very good progress on some areas, um, for example, energy transport, civil nuclear, uh, all made um, significant uh, progress. And transport uh, is one of the areas where actually uh, there isn't um, necessarily so quite so much distance uh, between us. But look, it is true to say, and uh, you will have heard all this before, uh, you know, this country not only voted um, to leave the EU, though I actually didn't in that referendum, but the country nonetheless did. But we've also had a general election since, in which a lot of people uh, 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 voted for uh, the manifesto um, saying that this is exactly what we're going to do and that we weren't going to end, uh, end uh, entertain an extension uh, to the transition period. And that remains the case. We think the best way of providing certainty to all businesses out there is to know uh, that we're not going to keep chopping and changing, that the transition period will end uh, at the uh, end of the year, to carry on these negotiations with the EU uh, in good faith, along with negotiations, negotiations with other uh, countries in the world, uh, and um, at least then to be able to provide the certainty. And I keep very close contact uh, with the haulage uh, industry, who, as you rightly say, uh, are right on the front line uh, during this um, crisis. And as I described in the freight package that I outlined today, uh, to which the government is also providing a significant uh, assistance, but no, we won't be extending to answer your question. Um, Jenny, on demand yeah, for just, testing. Um, so I, I think the underlying question was around the reliability of them. And obviously tests can uh, fail, if you like, for a number of reasons. The test may not be sensitive enough. It may not be specific enough. Uh, you can have problems, which we perhaps often hear about in vaccinations, for example, where things are not stored properly in chains. Um, so it's quite difficult to actually put, try and put any sort of number on the failure element, I think, which is what you're describing, of potentially uh, somebody taking the test themselves. But what I can assure you is we have done in, in trying to, in piloting these uh, tests, run uh, tests in parallel. So uh, having a trained worker take a test and then an individual who's not trained to take them. And actually, they're remarkably comparable for this. We wouldn't be launching something if it wasn't. Um, I think having said that, where we have some other testing, so for example, you will have heard about the uh, ONS survey, uh, that it's important we understand uh, uh, the um, prevalence of disease, we need to extrapolate data from that, make sure we understand as far as we can what the 
prevalence of diseases across the, the country, where we want it to be absolutely robust, then we will try and use exactly the same techniques and trained individuals so they are directly comparable. Um, and I think there are other settings uh, where it's, I mean, it actually can be quite an unpleasant thing to do um, and uh, it may not be uh, very normal. So, for example, in a care home where it's really important that we are looking after both our care workers and our residents, um, there, there's likely to be additional training there because it's, uh, we need to ensure that those tests are taken appropriately and we get good answers. There is actually a video that goes along uh, alongside this programme so people can see how they should do it. But we did try that and it came out uh, comparable. That's hugely helpful to know, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, Annabelle, do you want to come back on Brexit or testing kits? Um, yeah, I just want to come back on one more thing. Uh, many people in the UK will have seen the clip overnight of the President of the United States suggesting coronavirus might be treated by injecting disinfectant into the body. Do you have a message to Donald Trump about the dangers of spreading dangerous dis disinformation when governments around the world are trying to combat its spread from other sources? Here I'll defer to medical expertise, Jenny. <laughs> Um, so I wouldn't have a specific message to Donald Trump, I'd have a specific message to anybody who suggested they should be injecting anything into their bodies. Um, I mean, clearly, uh, we would not support, from a medical professional perspective, it is really important that people uh, use uh, appropriate treatments that are evidence-based and tested. We have very good programmes that have been uh, taken up very rapidly, coordinated in this country, uh, testing uh, various uh, different alternative treatments. Um, those trials will report reasonably early, but certainly nobody should be injecting anything and we should be using evidence-based and properly trialled treatments that we know will be safe. Perfectly clear. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Annabelle. John Walker from Birmingham Live and the Newcastle Chronicle. Um, Secretary of State, I'd like to raise again the issue of light rail systems, which, um, as you'll know, are playing a vast role in major cities getting key workers to work. You said that the Department of Transport will support them, but I don't think you've given any indication how much funding they can expect. So, for example, um, Tyne and Weir say they need a £10 million bailout just to keep the metro running until July. Uh, Manchester says their metro link is losing millions of pounds a month, and Transport for the West Midlands says that their metro is losing at least a million pounds a month and could be forced to close. Can you tell me how much funding these regions can expect? Um, Secondly, if I may, a question for Jenny Harris. Um, do we know why people from some ethnic minority backgrounds seem to be dying in disproportionately high numbers during this, this crisis? Or if we don't know at this stage, um, perhaps could you tell us what sort of work is taking place to try to find out? Thanks very much, John. Uh, to answer your question, no, I don't have uh, the actual figure for you, and that's because we're still uh, in discussions with the uh, various different um, systems and also discussing the level to which that they um, should be continuing to uh, provide service and also uh, other assistance that they're able to uh, access. Um, it, this, it, this is a package which runs into the millions. It's not a small uh, endeavour uh, to do this. Uh, and I mentioned the particular systems to which it will uh, apply more details soon. Um, but I, I also want to say that um, you, we heard, actually, I think in a comment earlier, uh, these systems are running way below ordinary uh, capacity and, and quite rightly because people are following the social distancing please don't go out unless you need to uh, instructions so um, it, it is a case of finding a, a uh, route with them which allows them to uh, remain viable entities but not continue to run uh, exactly the same service that they run uh, at the moment but we're actively in touch with them and I think it's good news today um, that we've announced there is going to be a multi-million pound package uh, to ensure that those light rail systems, which are excellent in, in all cases, uh, can continue. Jenny. Thank you. Um, so this is a hugely uh, important and hugely complex subject, so you actually may wish to stop me if I get into full flow. Um, it's really important when we look at uh, disease prevalence and severity, and particularly who, uh, uh, which individuals are losing their lives, we always look at different characteristics, uh, whether that be gender, whether it be age, or in this case our focus is on black and minority ethnic groups, um, and trying to untangle all of the different elements that might indicate that there was a, an excess of severe disease, an excess of uh, catching the disease in the first place, 
or even more importantly, those people who die from the disease, is very complex. Uh, and if I just give a, f a few examples, uh, number one, our data has to be very, very good. Um, and even the recording uh, of ethnicity, um, uh, both by um, a country of origin, for example, uh, or uh, an ethnic group which somebody um, uh, feels part of, that is hugely complex. So a death certificate will give uh, the country of origin, uh, but that may well not give uh, anything to do with how the individual has lived their lives or the community that they've lived in or the sorts of exposures to disease that they may have. So there is a huge amount of work ongoing on this as soon as there was an issue potentially identified, and I say potentially because I think we need to wait until we have very, very clear data. Um, uh, there was a meeting of uh, senior clinical professionals um, and uh, Public Health England announced, uh, or it was announced a couple of days ago, Public Health England will be doing a very detailed review into this. The sorts of things that need to be looked at, and I know will be, um, it's not just as simple as uh, the uh, ethnic um, uh, position, uh, but it will be things like, for example, uh, what are the conditions we know that individuals from particular ethnic backgrounds suffer from? So hypertension, high blood pressure, is something which we know carries an increased risk of severe disease and poor outcomes in COVID, um, and that is also more prevalent in some ethnic minorities. So it's, it's actually untangling this. I think the other things, though, are there some very important things. It's not just the underlying conditions. Um, it's also about how people live their lives. So uh, this disease will transmit more. We're all taking social distancing measures if we're very close together. So people who live in close communities uh, may well uh, have uh, poorer outcomes or more likely to transmit disease. Um, and obviously also uh, many uh, of our black and minority ethnic groups are in different uh, elements of uh, socioeconomic uh, status. And that is a really important point that also needs to be considered. I think the final point I just make is that actually it's really important that we engage with those communities to understand. Um, and in this country, we have very, very high representation um, in the NHS. So huge numbers of workers in the NHS uh, and in our frontline care services are from minority ethnic groups. And so we need to work, understand how they are represented. Uh, I know, for example, in healthcare, uh, in the very sad deaths in health workers, um, it may be that that is proportionate to the very high uh, benefit that they provide to our health service in the sense they are overrepresented. I think it's about 45% of um, uh, doctors in the London area, for example, are from minority ethnic groups. So very, very complex. All of those things need to be considered, and they are under very active consideration. Thank you very much indeed, Jenny. I, I know it's also true to say that something that Public Health England uh, are also uh, looking into. Um, Lastly, can I turn to Harrison Jones at the Metro, please? Thanks very much, Gron. Um, the health secretary promised 100,000 tests would be carried out daily by the end of the month before the goalpost was seemingly moved to talk about our capacity for testing. We hit less than 29,000 tests today. When will we reach the Prime Minister's previous target of 250,000? And how and when will testing be opened up beyond key workers and their families? Mm. Uh, and if I may, just an extra question on contact tracing uh, and the new NHS app. Are we expecting to follow a similar model to South Korea, which involves the public's movements being tracked by a mobile phone with GPS? Uh, thanks very much, Harrison. So, uh, look, um, on the uh, 100,000, um, this is the number of tests versus the capacity, and it's a well-worn um, discussion. I think what we've been finding is the capacity has been rising pretty fast. As I mentioned, Professor Newton just yesterday says that he thinks we're going to get to that 100,000 100, uh, ambition uh, by the end of the, uh, of the month. Uh, I think we can see that because the additional testing facilities uh, are coming on online and these are sort of super labs uh, and they're starting to look at the automation of those to make them even faster. The problem has been uh, that there haven't been sufficient uh, people being tested uh, coming forward through the route, which is uh, quite convoluted, of course, of somebody having to uh, go through their employer, perhaps the NHS or a care home, in order to take that test. Uh, what we've seen today uh, is there is excess demand for tests uh, out there, uh, and um, I can therefore confidently say, adding the two figures that you mentioned, the 28,000 who were tested yesterday through the ordinary system, and the 16,000 or so that I mentioned today, that the numbers are going to be rising uh, pretty sharply 
uh, and quite uh, fast. So I think that all backs what uh, was said yesterday, that uh, the number of uh, tests, as well as the capacity, so that the tests as well, uh, look like they are all headed in the right direction, and we look forward to seeing that. I think the Prime Minister mentioned 250,000 as an ambition without a particular timetable. Um, the important thing, which leads into your second question, is why we're doing this, and the, the contact testing tracing uh, is absolutely uh, vital to it. My understanding of the technology uh, is that uh, the app uses a uh, sort of Bluetooth uh, signal to completely anonymously uh, be able to uh, check who's been within a, a Bluetooth range uh, and then use that as part of the contact tracing uh, follow-up. Uh, I think that's the um, correct technical explanation on it. Jenny may have something to add and I think you want to come back in, Harrison. Shall I just add a little bit to that? So I think uh, the ambition, as you, as you say, is to uh, digitalise some of this process to try and um, support measures that can bring us back out of some of the social distancing uh, restrictions. Uh, clearly, uh, I'm sure we only have to look at our own families to think how many, uh, usually the younger generation, have got the right sort of uh, mobile phones and would be quite happily working that way. Uh, and as you work out the years, grandparents and things who perhaps don't. So having a single model around track and trace is not going to be possible. Um, it will require a certain proportion of us to be using those phones. It will require a very rapid um, testing of the key individual um, and very strict compliance of all of those who are triggered, if you like, who said you've been near somebody who may have uh, symptoms of coronavirus to take appropriate action. So I think there's quite a lot of work to keep going on that and we are likely to have some sort of hybrid response in order to manage both the digital side um, and human nature, but um, ex exactly heading in the right direction and obviously the testing in that scenario will be really important. We heard yesterday about the 18,000 contact tracing um, uh, people. I think it's also true to say you require quite high take up of the app to make it useful and this will be another great national effort required. It will be an NHS um, app and I know that how people feel about supporting our NHS, this will be a new way to show uh, support for it when that's available. And finally, I'll just come back to you, Harrison. Thanks, yeah, just on the, the 250,000 target, um, Boris Johnson talks about the 25th of March. Do you have a date when that 250,000 target is going to be reached or is it just going to stay as an ambition? I think it was a, an ambition from um, the, the Prime Minister uh, and actually uh, I think that the fact that we've been able to um, go from, I recall, I think when the Health Secretary was talking about this, 7,000 tests a day were being carried out on average uh, each day and it now looks uh, likely we'll get certainly to the 100,000 capacity and quite likely to the testing of 100,000 day, a day as well. It uh, shows what we can achieve and I do pay huge tribute to the many different organisations who've been involved in um, getting us uh, there, not just Public Health England, uh, but the, uh, the, the, the private labs, the universities, uh, and the enormous scale-up that's been required to achieve something which uh, you know, looked like a very ambitious, indeed was, a very, very ambitious target. Harrison, thank you very much indeed. I just wanted to finish by um, saying that we're often asked about um, when this particular phase uh, can come to a, an end. And, in many ways, the answer to that, I think, lies in our own hands. This is going to be another sunny weekend. Uh, we know that we've made a lot of great gains that Jenny has been explaining to us in those graphs earlier of flattening the curve. But it's absolutely essential uh, that we do not let that slip this weekend. And the message as ever remains the same, uh, to stay home, protect the NHS and therefore save lives. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.